great chapter. So we're preaching, I'm preaching a series uh, from this chapter that I just simply called uh, Pilgrims, because it talks about there that we're strangers and pilgrims in verse 13. And, uh, <laughs> and so on the way up here, I realized about halfway up here, I realized I didn't have my, uh, my notes. And I'm one, not one of those guys that can just kind of preach off the cuff like that. So uh, my, my daughter got the uh, privilege of, di- uh, of writing down what I dictated to her. So uh, if I make any mistakes, I'm just going to blame her uh, this morning. But the title of the message is this, Faith Isn't Fair. Faith Isn't Fair. And on one hand, you look at that and say, well, actually, faith is pretty fair if you think about it. Like, it doesn't matter how much of a sinner you are. You could be somebody who's lived a pretty good life your whole life, or you could be someone that's fallen, fallen into all kinds of, of terrible sin. And yet, we all, if you think about it, it's kind of like an equal playing field because we all come to God the same way, through faith in Jesus Christ. And so, uh, in a way, it's, you seem like, hey, that's, it's very fair. Right? But there might be those who kind of think of this as, you know, uh, I was born in certain circumstances or whatever, so it's harder for me to put my faith into somebody. I remember listening to this interview uh, where this guy just could not come to the, uh, he couldn't grasp the fact that the Bible says salvation is just through belief. He didn't want to accept that. He said it just doesn't make sense. Doesn't seem like God would. He said it just seems unfair. Maybe I don't have, you know, maybe I don't, I can't believe enough. That's not my fault. And he's like, you know, somebody else. It might be easier for them to believe, but I just can't believe. And so I think it would be make more sense. It'd be more fair if I was judged according to my works. And I thought, man, I'd hate to be the guy that stands before God saying, well, you know, God, it just wasn't fair, <laughs> you know. But so, in a way, it might seem like faith isn't fair. And I was thinking about the illustration just in, in the context of, of the pilgrims. And I mentioned a little bit a couple lessons ago about how the uh, pilgrims came. And, and just imagine like having to, having to just pack up all the belongings that you can and uh, everything that you think you need to survive and packing it onto a ship and knowing that you're going to be on that ship for who knows how long. Uh, and it might not even survive the trip. It's going to be cold. It's going to be miserable. You're going to run out of food. There's going to be all these obstacles coming, but you have to decide. I'm getting on the ship. I'm going on the trip. I'm not turning back, and we're just going to go with it by faith. Now, if you were somebody who was used to being on the seas, you've done a lot of traveling, you understand maybe you're stronger and you're healthier, maybe younger, It doesn't seem like it takes as much faith to to just decide that you're going to do that. Or maybe you're someone that's so poor and and you know you're destitute anyway. It's not going to make, you know, uh, much difference to you one way or another. So you're like, well, yeah, what do I got to lose? I'm getting on the ship, right? And then contrast that with somebody who has got a lot of wealth and maybe their land was pretty, you know, uh, fruitful and everything seemed to be going pretty well. Why do I want to leave this hoping that I might find something better? It might be a little bit harder for them to give that up, a little harder to get on the boat, you know, or somebody who is a sicker, you know, or oh, more kind of one of the elderly people or whatever. And they're thinking, man, if I get on that boat, the chances of me making it, you know, pretty low, maybe I'll just stay here where I am. I won't be a pilgrim and, and go over to, the, to start another colony or whatever. Maybe that's not for me. And so there are lots of factors involved, maybe even in how much faith somebody has is in the sense of just, you know, uh, putting their faith in what the Bible says ultimately is what I want to talk about. So look here at our text in Hebrews 11. We come to verse 4. Hebrews 11 verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. Man, I love to just preach a little bit about what the gift was, what it represented, and how it still speaks to us today. But the point I want to make this morning has more to do with just the difference between Cain and the difference of, uh, between uh, him and Abel, and uh, particularly Cain. Because I have this feeling, just reading the context there, you get this feeling that Cain's attitude was like, this isn't fair. 
I mean, obviously, he took it kind of overboard and got jealous and killed his brother as a result of it. But from the very beginning, he felt like he's saying, this isn't fair. God accepted his sacrifice, didn't accept mine. You know, that's just not fair. And I want to give you three reasons that he may have, he may have decided this wasn't fair. And there are reasons that today people say, you know, that's, the, the, these situations aren't fair. Plus, all these are backed up in the Bible. And so the first one is this. Let's look at Genesis chapter 4 and get the story here. Genesis chapter 4, very familiar passage. And I'm just going to read the story here from the first seven verses. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Uh, it made me think, because I, I, I struggled for a while to, to figure out, uh, you know, a long time ago whenever I studied this, trying to figure out what does that mean? Uh, sin, you shall rule over him. Sin shall be at your door and you shall rule over him. And here's what I think it means. And actually what helped me kind of put this in perspective even more is I, ha I had the picture in my notes, but I, I left it. But uh, I saw this, uh, uh, this cartoon. Maybe you've seen it, I don't know. But the cartoon had uh, these two different sections. And the first section had a cell phone. And a man was looking at the cell phone and this said, this is, what we th this is how we think. Uh, this is what we think is going on. And he, and he was commanding the cell phone what to do. You know, he was giving it orders. You know, go, go here, direct me to this place. And he's giving all those, those kind of orders. And then the second one said, well, here's what's really going on. And then the cell phone was telling the guy, your bills do pay it. And he's, <laughs> you know, restaurant, check in. And he's saying all that. Anyway, that sounds kind of silly. But, uh, but if you think about it, that's kind of what's going on with Cain. He says, look, if you do wrong, if you in your heart choose to disobey, you're not going by faith and you do wrong, it's almost like God gave him a second chance. You know, why are you wroth? Look, if you do right, I'll be happy. But if you don't do right, I'm not going to be happy. And then he says, and sin lieth at your door. And he says that uh, uh, you shall be, uh, where was that verse again? He says, uh, sin lieth at the door. And uh, help me out, I forgot. Verse 7 uh, Right, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. You kind of see this idea, like it's, it's he's thinking that he's controlling, you know, he's doing all the action, but really he's just consumed, he's in bondage to sin. He's a slave to sin, right? And he thinks that he's doing uh, good, and he's given the orders, he's got control of his life. But anyway, that's kind of how I, how I read that. But it's like God gave him a second chance there. And of course, you know the rest of the story. He kills his brother out of jealousy and rage. And of course, he's cursed. And then even after his curse, he's like, oh, that's more than I can bear. And it's just, you know, you just get this idea that he was just this guy that, you know, hey, nothing's fair. It's just not fair. He's like, should have been born in the, uh, the millennial uh, uh, generation, <laughs> you know, just entitlement and everything. And so uh, anyway, uh, sorry, a lot of people in here are in that generation. <laughs> <laughs> so let me give you a couple of things here. Number one, <laughs> number one, here's one of the things that Cain might have thought. He was born into unfortunate circumstances, all right? Now I'm going to use this to uh, bring up some other points, but the, uh, in this case, you say, well, that doesn't seem like he's much different than, than Abel in this, but yeah, well, you got to think about this is Cain, okay? This is Cain making his excuses here. And it's like, he, when he was born, he probably didn't have a choice. Hey, do I get to till, t tend to the sheep or do I have to, you know, till the, till the guard, till the land? You know, I'm sure his parents just kind of told him this is the job that you're assigned to. And so his job was to till the earth, 
plant the vegetables. I mean, I don't know what all exactly uh, was his job. And probably he looked over at his brother and said, man, he's got the piece of cake job sitting back. You know, all he's got to do is count sheep. You know, he, you know how you always think that someone's job is easier than your job. <laughs> and, he's, and he's looking at that saying, boy, that's just not, you know, it's just not fair. Like I have to, I have to have this job and he has that job. And it comes time to bring the sacrifice. And I don't know those story. I get the impression whenever I read here in Hebrews 11 and I go back to that, that they knew that this is what God expected for the sacrifice. I, I don't think it was a surprise that he was supposed to bring a lamb. Okay. But I could see him sitting, you know, and thinking like, yeah, well, it's easy for him to bring a lamb. It's his sheep. I've got to go over there, try to get a sheep from him. And I've got to, you know, sacrifice it. I don't know anything about all that. This is my job. So I'm going to bring God from the fruit of my hands, what I did in this, you know, instead of seeking what would make God happy by faith, he said, that's not fair. I'll do it my way. And I don't suspect anybody in here would have mercy on him, but, but to some degree, you might say, well, he's kind of got a point. I mean, it wasn't like he had a choice. I mean, that was his job, and Abel had, had his job. Well, turn to Romans chapter 1. That's two sermons in a row we got to go to Romans chapter 1. And this morning, I went to Romans chapter 1 in Iola. Romans chapter 1, and verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, as God neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So one day, people will stand before the Lord, and they're going to say, hey, it wasn't my fault. I was born in a third world country. How many times have you heard people pose that question? What about these guys that live in a, a third world country? And they never heard the gospel. You know, It's not fair that God would hold them to the same standard as somebody who was born where everybody's preaching the gospel. And number one, God says here, he says, look, you're not without excuse. Nobody's without excuse. Okay, Everybody has... Uh, there's something within them where there's, there's an understanding that there's a God, there's an understanding that, hey, there's a creator and all this. And, you know, I, I don't even completely understand how God will direct somebody who fears him, even though they haven't heard the gospel. I've heard a lot of stories. God sending a, a, a missionary. You've kind of heard those kinds of stories to somebody. But here's the deal. A lot of people will take that and say, well, that's not fair. It's not fair that God would allow that to happen. And, and man, I've talked to so many people that say, well, I'm a Christian. I believe Jesus is my Savior. And then they say, but if somebody was raised you know, in a Jewish home and they don't believe in Jesus, that's not their fault as long as they're sincere. You know, and if someone was in a Buddha, grown in a Buddhist house, you know, as long as they're sincere, sincere about their religion, God wouldn't look at that and have a problem with that. But, but so here, here's just one simple you know, logical conclusion that you can take from that. Well, then, if Jesus told us to go into the whole world and preach the gospel to everyone, right, what would be the point if people who've never heard the gospel get another, you know, get another chance or they get to get in a free pass because they never heard the gospel, then we would be saving people by not telling them the gospel, right? But actually, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So you say, man, I'm so burdened by those people in the 1040 window that never heard the gospel. Well, what's stopping you from going, right? If you want to go take the gospel, look, we're supposed to get the gospel into the whole world. And if every, uh, especially independent fundamental Baptist preacher had that vision and said, hey, what can we do to reach the whole world? I mean, if you really did the math, counted up how many independent fundamental Baptists there, there are, Somebody did that, and I can't remember what it was, but, you know, it wouldn't take but maybe just a couple days for us to reach the whole world if everybody just had an X amount of people that they were going to give the gospel to. So in theory, right, it's, it's a much, much smaller job than we think it is. But we understand the difficulties and how hard it's going to be to take the gospel into the whole world. But that is what God commanded us to do. And so it's not really our fault if 
uh, tribe heard, had the gospel at one point, because really, in a way, the gospel's already gone into the whole world. And if they had the gospel and people rejected it, you know, it's no one's fault except theirs. And, it, and, and we need to try to get the gospel to the whole world, but if it doesn't get them, hey, they're still without excuse. They're still without excuse. You say, well, that doesn't sound fair. Well, faith isn't fair. Or life isn't fair, really. I remember growing up, and how many times did you hear that as a parent? That's not fair. Life isn't fair. <laughs> it's like, get used to it. You get what you get, you don't throw a fit, right? <laughs> who, who, am I to just, who am I to be like Cain and look God in the face and say, God, that's not fair. <laughs> you know, just, it's, ridic it's ridiculous that he did that, but, uh, but that's what people do, okay? So here's the thing. Many people, now that's particularly, I'm talking about salvation, but let's go a step further because we understand when we're talking about faith, even in this chapter, we understand that, that faith, by faith, right, nobody can be saved without faith. You come to God, you must believe that he is, right? But then there's also this, this understanding that after a person's saved, we, we still live by faith. We still walk by faith, not by sight. And so we have to, even in our life as a Christian and following the Lord, we're living by faith. And the things that we do and, and how much we give to the Lord and how much we trust in His Word uh, and what it says to guide our life is based on how much faith we have. Now, let me ask you this. I was born in a home. My parents weren't saved uh, whenever I was really young, but I got saved around seven years old. And shortly after, my parents got saved. So they started getting plugged into church. They started making sure that we went every service, got involved in the ministries there and all that. And it wasn't long before I was one of the kids whose parents said, you're going to be in church. You don't have any say about it. And they were always independent, fundamental, King James, Baptist churches. I praise the Lord for that. I don't want to take that for granted that I had that privilege of being raised under good, sound teaching of the Bible. Uh, they made me go to church every service. I didn't really have a choice, you know. <laughs> It was like you're going to be there no matter what. If I had baseball practice, you know, I remember sometimes kind of throwing a fit because I was like, come on, it's just this once. I miss church. Uh, it's just a practice. If I don't make practice, I probably won't start on the, on the team. And they said, no, we're not going to compromise. You're going to be in church for the, uh, for during, whenever there's a service. And if you got a problem with that, take it up with your coach, you know, and, uh, and whatever. But so you say, well, yeah, see, so that's so simple for you. It's easy for you to trust the Bible and live that life. And uh, it's, you never fell into all these sins. You never did drugs, never even drank alcohol, you know, virgin before I got married and all these kinds of things that the world's like, man, I just don't see how anybody could do that. So you begin to tell them the things you did. Well, that's easy because you grew up in a Christian home. You didn't have all these kinds of things to, to hinder you. And so now, you know, maybe this person fell into some problems with alcohol or drugs or something and the rest of their life. They're like, you just, you just don't understand the struggle I have because the lifestyle I was in and it's hard and I can't get victory over that and all that. Well, guess what? It, it, it might not seem fair to you, but you're, you have the same requirements that anybody else has, no matter what your upbringing was, no matter what the situations you were born into. And so Cain says, you know, hey, I was born into this unfortunate circumstance. Person in another country, you know, might think, hey, I don't, it's not my fault I was born into a Muslim uh, country or a pagan country or whatever. But all of us are required to have the same faith and the same God and the same Bible. The second thing that Cain might have thought and I've heard some people speculate that Cain and Abel, Abel, Abel were twins because uh, the way it's worded there, whatever. I don't think that's necessarily the case. But either way, somebody might say that Cain, uh, you know, he had the seniority. He was the first child. You know, he should have had been entitled and uh, he should have been able to get uh, the blessing there. Isn't it interesting how many places in the Bible... Uh, now, all the younger siblings here are going to get excited here for a minute, but all the places in the Bible where the younger sibling is the one that got the blessing, even though it was set up in the Old Testament law that the older sibling, the older brother was to get the uh, inheritance or whatever, but look how many times the Bible focuses and emphasizes, even the, gives the blessing to the younger child. You think about Ephraim and Manasseh, and, uh, and uh, Jacob was was trying to give a blessing, right? 
And he put it on the, the younger one's hand. And Joseph said, oh, no, you're supposed to be on Ephraim's head. I think you got this mixed up. You're not seeing well. You're getting old. And he says, no, this is the way it's supposed to be. And he gave a blessing to the younger child. You think about Ishmael and Isaac. I know there's some other details involved there, but I, Ishmael, you know, Abraham said, oh, that Ishmael might live for the Lord. And he said, no, 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 Isaac. And Isaac will be uh, the blessings. Uh, man, Jacob and Esau, right? It ends up, the blessing ends up going to Esau. Gideon was the, the, was the youngest, uh, at least in his house. And, and so you see over and over all these examples of that. And really, I think there's, one really good uh, reason for that. I really think that the picture that God is showing all through the Old Testament by, by showing that is, is he's kind of giving kind of like a foreshadowing what's going to happen in the New Testament. Because if you think about it, Israel is like the firstborn. Okay, They should have had the inheritance. They should have got all the blessings. They should have had favor with God. But what happens, the blessing is taken away from them in the New Testament and put on primarily Gentiles, but really just anybody that believes. It's not the Gentile, I mean, not the Jews, according to their customs and their beliefs and, or because they were born, you know, because of their blood, because they're Abraham's seed. No, the Bible says in, uh, in Galatians and other places as well, it says that, that we're all the seed of Abraham through faith, right? And so I think that's the good picture that he's showing. But oftentimes God will allow the younger person to be blessed. Look at Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20 is an interesting, an interesting parable that somebody might say, that just doesn't seem fair. In fact, that's what the people in this parable say. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1, For the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is talking here, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, that was a day's wage, okay? It's not like uh, we think about a penny today. That was a whole day's wage. He sent them into his vineyard, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and uh, ninth hour did likewise. And about the eleventh hour... He went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They said unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Go ye unto, uh, also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came and were... Uh, when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. And when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, These uh, last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, uh, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no, long, no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. What a great picture there. And be honest, man, at your workforce, if that ever happened, wouldn't you be a little perturbed? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. That guy worked one hour. I've been working 11 hours. <laughs> and that's a 12-hour shift, you know. And, and I worked the whole time. This guy worked one hour, and he gets the same thing I get. That's not fair, right? But in God's economy, he's saying, no, that's perfectly fair. I can do whatever I want with my money, and I made this deal. If you'll work for me, I'm going to give you the inheritance, I actually have talked to people. Uh, anybody familiar with the Baptist bride uh, doctrine? You know, somewhat. Okay. So there's actually guys that call them bright. Some of them call them briders, Baptist briders. I've talked to a lot of missionaries who, uh, who have actually had questionnaires sent to them. 
Like if they're going to be a missionary, they have to, they have to adhere to all these things. And, and it's basically just it's like Baptist brideism. Anyway, uh, and here's the idea. They say, you know, we can trace our roots all the way back to John the Baptist. And, you know, that if your church, you know, had to have been started by a church that was started by a church that was started by a church that was started and follow that line all the way back to John the Baptist. And they're all Baptists. Uh, nowadays, even independent fundamental Baptists, I think, that, I think you have to like, that's, you know, all the other ones are fake, but this has to be this line. It's really kind of strange because I don't even think that's possible for anybody to even begin to follow back. But they say, if you have all that and you're a Baptist and you've been baptized a Baptist and you did all that, there are, it goes so far that some think that's the only way you can be saved, right? But primarily what they, the, the, I think the more common view is this is the way I heard somebody explain it to me. He says, no, I don't believe you have to do that to be saved. He said, but I think when we get to heaven at the banqueting table, right, basically it's like, it's like we get the table, you know, we get the, like the special blessings because we're, ba- we're the Baptist, the true Baptist, right? And everybody else gets kind of like the little kid's seat or something. I don't know. <laughs> It's like this, this strange idea, right, that, you know, well, we're, we deserve something because we've been Baptist longer and we, you know, we understand that. And it's ridiculous, okay? But everybody wants to make their own works and their effort and their seniority and their, you know, uh, uh, title and all this kind of stuff the most important thing. And God says, no, the most important thing is that you have faith. Amen. And we understand that for salvation. I don't think anyone in here has a problem with that. But then living our life according to the Word of God and trusting in what the Bible says rather than our own feelings and our own flesh and all that still requires faith. And you say, well, yeah, well, it's easy for you to have faith, not easy for me to have faith. No, faith is faith. All right. And like I said, as much as it seem, might seem unfair, if you think about it, really, that's the fairest thing there can be because God's not a respecter of persons. You know, it's kind of like. Living in America and somebody says, well, I've been held back and I, you know, I just can't get ahead because uh, of my race or something like that. And you think, man, I've sure heard a lot of stories where people were born in a bad situation and they, they ended up kind of making something of their lives and even becoming successful and all. And, they, and, and then there's other people that just sit around and say, it's just not fair. I just don't think I can do it. It's just I was born this way. I didn't really have, I don't, there's nothing else I can, I can do. And when you look at it and the thing, you know, no, you all have equal opportunities, right? And that using America for an example might be a stretch, but look, in a way we all have equal opportunities with the Lord, you know? It doesn't matter what your upbringing is. There's not different classes of people, you know? Uh, We're all uh, equal before the Lord, but some think it's not fair. Here's a third thing. The third thing Cain might have said, first he might have said, you know, hey, I was born into unfortunate circumstances. I had seniority, the third thing might be, Cain might have said, well, I worked harder. I worked harder. I don't know. Like, I would think that uh, taking care of sheep would be a pretty difficult job. But again, it might be that he said, man, that's just a piece of cake job. And he, he doesn't even know what it's like to get his hands dirty and really get in there. And you got to deal with thorns and you got to deal with all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and it could be. But isn't that really how it is? Typically, people that are looking at somebody else and saying, man, you know, I work so much harder than that person. A lot of times they don't. They just think that they do. (laughs) But other people are putting just as much work into whatever. But whatever the case, Cain may have thought, hey, man, I'm I'm working harder than him. This just isn't fair that he gets gets all this. And let me just say this. You say, well, you just talked about seniority. Well, seniority is not the issue when it comes to working hard because, look, I used to work. I remember working at UPS. And uh, t- UPS was a Teamster company, like the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the union, you know, a bunch of union workers. And these union workers, it was all about seniority. It was all about, like, I just want to milk the clock and uh, get, all the, get all the money that I can, you know, and, and just make other people do work uh, for me or whatever. And there are guys that have been on the field forever, man, and they're like, well, I got seniority, so I get to do that first. And you're like, man, you're a lousy worker. I don't want you to, to, to do that for me. But no, but I got seniority, right? So just because someone has seniority, just because they're the oldest, just because they've been there the longest, whatever, doesn't necessarily mean anything about how hard they work. In fact, somebody else might come on the scene and be way more zealous than all the people that have seniority. They might be way more knowledgeable. And, uh, you know, and I think about that um, 
I'm not necessarily making a parallel to this, but I think about that a lot in my life. You know, I, like I said, I was saved at seven years old. Man, I went to Bible college, you know, when I was, uh, I don't know, what, 20 years old. I uh, went to Bible college. Then I went to, a, and that was a kind of a more uh, liberal college. But then I went to uh, another Bible college that was a little more conservative. And I had all that study. And I had all that training. I was under good preaching and all that. And I remember one time going soul winning with somebody. And I was telling them about how long I had been saved. I was telling them I went to uh, uh, different Bible colleges and everything. And this guy had been saved for like a year. And he said, oh, man, you've been, you've been doing that a long time. Well, man, I'm ready to learn some tips from you. You're probably a great soul winner. But this guy had been saved only like a year or two years. And he was an awesome soul winner. And I remember feeling ashamed because I was like, man, I had all this time. You know, I had all this and I took it for granted. Like I really didn't do the work. I really didn't get the experience that I needed to. I'm just like learning little nuggets, you know, from schooling and from preaching, you know, and I'm not really soaking it up like I should. I'm doing my daily Bible reading, but I'm not really just like doing above and beyond and really studying and going deep. And so all those years go by and it's like, man, you got seniority, man. You're like, you're just really worthy, right? But I'm not, right? And so I feel uh, oftentimes, and man, I can talk to a lot of preachers that tell you the exact same thing. It's like, man, I wasted all those years. I wish I could have just done more and I could have got uh, ahead. But here's what happens. A lot of times somebody will come in and they'll say, I just don't understand. And they'll even look at somebody who's been saved a long time, but they're just not doing anything for the Lord. They're just not really putting much effort into it. And they'll say, I just don't understand why these guys aren't doing anything. You know, and there's an old rule, rule of thumb that says uh, it's like 80, 20 principle. And they say, you know, of all the work that needs to be done, there's always like 20 percent that do the majority of the work. The 80 percent hardly do anything. And man, if you go to churches, it's, it's that's pretty accurate. I mean, that's typically the case. You don't it's not like you don't love the 80 percent, but you're like, man, that 20 percent, they're the ones that do all the work. I can always count on them, trust them to get things done. Well, sometimes somebody that kind of falls into that 20%, we'll look at everybody else and say, man, this is just isn't fair. Like, I'm doing all this work, busting my tail, working hard, and they're not doing anything. <laughs> you know, it just seems like I should get the special blessings or something like that. Well, look at Matthew 20. And look at verse uh, 27. We were just in Matthew 20, but go down to verse 27. I love this verse here. It says, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your servant. You know, and if you need a, a picture of that, if you don't know what that looks like, think of Jesus. Jesus, never, he's sinless, perfect. He's come, he's come to give his life a ransom, right? And he's come to, to in, in, invest in his uh, disciples, send them out into the world. He's come to heal people. He's come to do all this stuff to give, give, give of himself. And then there he is in the upper room getting ready to be crucified sh shortly after. And he gets down and he's washing the disciples' feet. You know, you can understand Peter saying, Oh, Lord, why are you washing my feet? I should be washing yours. Right? He's like, I don't understand this. And Jesus is saying, Hey, what you saw me do, do to others. Now, you think those disciples deserve to get their stinky feet washed by Jesus? No, they didn't deserve it. But he was showing them something. He was like, hey, even though these guys got stinky feet, even though you might not even like them, even though you got James and John over here fighting about who's going to get the best seat in the kingdom of God, and you got Timothy over, I mean, uh, 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 Thomas over here doubting everything, and you got Peter over here who's overzealous and, and, uh, and, and wants to do everything and, and, and just kind of like disagreeing with Jesus every time he says something. It's like, not so, Lord, and <laughs> all these kinds of things. If it was you, you'd say, man, these guys don't deserve anything. But Jesus washed their feet, and he made himself a servant unto them. And really, that's what we ought to do. You say, well, I just, it just doesn't seem fair. Look, just step out and do it by faith. And don't worry, man, if you, you don't think others deserve it, you think, hey, I'm better than them, I work harder than them, I deserve more, or whatever. Get that stuff out of your head and just say, I'm just doing it by faith uh, because it's what the Bible tells me to do. So the conclusion, very simple, is this. Number one, and we all know this, everyone is saved through faith 
whether it's unfair or not fair, I mean, whether it's fair or unfair, everyone's saved the same way through faith in Jesus Christ, okay? And number two, after you're saved, everyone must live by faith, follow the word, follow the commandments. Hey, you don't get, you know, leeway. Well, you don't have to do that because you had a rough life. Well, you don't have to do that because you were born into a different circumstance. No, we got the same commandments. We've got the same Bible. We've got the same rules to follow, uh, whether it seems fair or unfair. Just trust in the Lord by faith, and He will bless you. He will reward you according to your works. Lord, I, I pray that you help us to live our lives through faith, not to ever get caught up in uh, thinking that it's unfair that we might have to do um, more than somebody else. And Lord, I was thinking about how uh, if you said, to whom much is given, much shall be required. And Lord, I think in my life about having so many years uh, in the ministry and in uh, with the family going to church, and I think about my wife and her family, and uh, and just the inheritance that we have, godly inheritance. Uh, Lord, I know that that's going to mean that a lot is required out of us. But at the same time, Lord, I realize that anybody in here who hasn't had that upbringing, uh, they still have the responsibility to seek your word and to know the truth and to live by it, no matter what their fail failures and their shortcomings and their faults are. Lord, help us pr pr uh, pray for one another, encourage one another, and help each other as we get through this life, as we walk as pilgrims on this earth, Lord, uh, living by faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.